Steve, should I be like right on this, this microphone or um, right on it like that? Or is that too loud? Like this, something like this, yeah. yeah, that's good. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll keep it a distance then.
Well, good afternoon. good afternoon. It's good to see all of you. Uh, my name is uh, John Schuck. I'm the pastor at Southminster Presbyterian Church in Beaverton. And uh, it was nice to be invited to be able to make this uh, presentation here uh, this afternoon on my trip to Iraq uh, this last fall. So I have a few slides up here of that. And uh, we, we took a video, uh, or we're actually in the process of producing it, so um, that'll come out within, in about a month or so. So, but this is really just a PowerPoint um, of, of the experience. And I r will do it, and then really invite your, your questions and your comments uh, about, about that, especially in terms of clarification of you know, what, what actually we're doing. But before I do that, I do want to make an, an advertisement. We are excited to have John Dominic Crossan, Mr. Historical Jesus, uh, come to Southminster uh, on April 5th and 6th to talk about his book on the resurrection. And so it's called The Contemporary Challenge of Easter. And so we'll have a lot of these flyers out, and I hope you'll get a chance to, to go and, and invite your friends to come. It's really a kind of a big score, we think, for us to be able to get to him to come to uh, Portland. What you see here is, and can everybody hear me okay? Are we okay with sound? All right. Yep. This is in Karbala, Iraq. And this is a picture taken from, that we took uh, from the top of the shrine of Imam Hussein. And we are looking at the shrine of his half-brother Abbas. All right, so that shrine that you see is actually kind of a mirror image of the sh what we're standing on. Uh, this is during a season called Arba'in, which literally means 40th. So before we get started, let me just give you a quick run ground of who Hussein is. So Hussein is the grandson of the prophet Muhammad. And what I learned most about anything going over there is that Hussein saved Islam. Uh, and all Muslims believe this. So this isn't just a Shia thing or a Sunni thing. Uh, all Muslims regard Hussein as an important person. He was the, as the grandson of, of the Prophet Muhammad. And what happened in the story is that after the death of Muhammad, then uh, there's confusion about who, who's going to take him over, uh, take over uh, the, the running of Islam. And a politician gets in place, the short story here, and his name is Yazid. And he ends up being a bad guy. And it's almost in a, in a, in a cosmic sense. So Yazid uh, demands of Hussein, who also has a great following too, to bow to Yazid, to give the authority to Yazid. And Hussein realizes that Yazid is just, you know, he's a corrupt politician. And so he's not worthy of taking over and, 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 and Islam. And so he refuses. Well, as it turns out, uh, again, the short story, uh, Hussein and his family and uh, a small band are, end up being in the desert in Karbala, Iraq, the plains of Karbala, as they say. And Yazid surrounds him with 30,000. So it's 30,000 to 72, all right, demanding that uh, Hussein give uh, his authority and his allegiance to Yazid. And Hussein refuses. No, I will not do that. And so it's a slaughter results. And uh, Hussein and, and all of his companions are, are killed. Uh, the only survivors are women and children, and they are taken uh, as prisoners to Damascus, Syria. And uh, while they're there, Hussein's sister Zainab uh, speaks of, of the story of what happened and tells it into the court of Yazid itself and the people of Damascus here really what the truth is. And so then Yazid wants to run them out back again. And so their home is Medina uh, in Saudi Arabia, what's currently Saudi Arabia. Um, but on their way home, Zainab, the sister of Hussein, who was slain in, in Karbala, um, wants to go back to uh, Karbala to see her brother and the family and all the, all the people who were killed. And so they arrive there on the 40th day after the battle. So Ashura, or the 10th day of Muharram, the month of Muharram, the 10th day is when Ashura is when the battle happened. Uh, and so 40th day at Arba'in is the visitation. And so throughout history since then, people have um, gone and, and visited, uh, especially on the holy day of Arba'in, uh, visiting uh, the shrine of 
Hussein. So in the, in the shrine is his, uh, where the spot is marked where he was killed as well as uh, the, his grave. So that's the, the quick short story of Hussein. And the, the, how it relates to Shias is Shias regard um, Hussein and those who are related uh, to the prophet, the Alul Bayt, of uh, those who know Hebrew, Bayt it means house. Well, that's also the same in Arabic. So uh, the household of the prophet and those teachers or those imams, and there are 12 of them as they go down through, through history, are uh, important teachers to, uh, along with the Quran of what the, uh, of what Islam is supposed to be. And so Hussein is an example of sacrifice, ultimate sacrifice for truth and for justice. All right, so that's the, the, basic, the basic thing. Um, yes? The person that killed him, yes. was he also a relative or was he just completely unrelated? He was unrelated to uh, uh, Muhammad. Yeah, so it's a battle of, co of good versus evil. And so uh, a, a cosmic significance, an incredible cruelty on behalf of Yazid to Hussein and incredible bravery on Hussein and Abbas and, and all, of the, uh, all of, the, of the family there. So, okay. Uh, okay, so there are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. Uh, 400 million of them are Shia. Uh, Shia simply means way. There are about uh, 700,000 Shia uh, who live in the United States. There are about four mosques, Muslim mosques, four or five, maybe half a dozen, four, five, six in the Portland metro. Uh, only one of them is Shia. And in fact, the only Shia mosque in all of Oregon is the one that's right across the street from my church on Denny and Hall in Beaverton. And so I went to Iraq to meet my neighbors across the street in a sense. Uh, the, uh, we have had connections with them uh, three years ago. This is actually the backyard of my congregation, Southminster in, in Beaverton. And the uh, students from the mosque wanted to uh, have a celebration of Ramadan and breaking the fast. And so for three nights, we had it in, on, in our church. And so we had different speakers and they came and hosted it and had meals and, and whatnot. So it was a way of interfaith gathering. So we've had a relationship with them. We share parking, we do different things, celebrated Jesus and Muhammad's birthdays, that type of thing. So uh, we had a relationship with them. Uh, I went um, on behalf, I was asked to go, and actually my way was paid by the Husseiniya Islamic Society of Seattle. And uh, who was with me there is Josh Townsley, and he's the executive director of Evergreen Habitat for Humanity in Clark County, Washington, in Vancouver. And he's pretty good with cameras, and he brought his tripod and stuff like that. Where, and so we went to, to see if we couldn't make uh, a, a video of our experience. And so what we're showing off there are our passes. So we had to go to the, <laughs> who can make a documentary about getting a pass? So we've got media passes to be able to go into the shrine and take photos. Uh, and we were also allowed to go to the top, as you saw that first picture, and take pictures. So that enabled us to have a lot of access uh, camera-wise. Uh, Iraq, uh, if you go to, I went to see my uh, doctor and I told him I was going to Iraq and what do I need for, if I need anything for shots. And he said, he looked it up and said, you can't go to Iraq. State Department says, don't go. So it's a level four for Americans not to go uh, in regards to, as it says there, uh, terrorism or whatnot. But my experience and Josh's experience was not that at all. Uh, we, were, we were safe as I could ever be. Uh, uh, we walked around the city of Karbala alone. We did the walk alone. Um, it was the safest place as any. We didn't see any type of crime or anything, especially during this great celebration of Arba'in. So um, I would hope that other Americans will come. This is a map of Iraq. We were in Karbala. Karbala is about the size of Portland uh, in terms of population, about a million, million and a half. And uh, that's, uh, whoop, sorry. And so you can see it's there, Najaf is, um, the, the city south of it, uh, 50 miles away, and so there's a, a celebratory walk 
between Najaf and Karbala that uh, Shia pilgrims will do to visit the shrines of, of Hussein and Abbas. Um, and, and I'll talk about that more, but that's, that's that kind of 50 mile thing. People will fly in, people will come in, or, or wherever they're coming from, even walking there uh, and go on this journey. We also went to um, Baghdad and Samarra, and those are our shrines. So for the Shias, especially the shrines of the Imams and where they ended up being buried are important. Okay. So we went with a tour group. So this is a tour group from the United States that takes Shia pilgrims uh, to uh, these various sites and, uh, and centers. And so um, he's, he was our tour guide, uh, Muhammad Beg, and uh, Sheikh uh, Ramadan, it was his student. Um, there is a picture of us. We became actually very good friends. Uh, Beg is from um, uh, Los Angeles and he's a, a sheikh, a religious leader, and he, and he taught uh, in Florida, and that's how Sheikh Ramadan, we just called him Sheikh, uh, ended up being his student. Uh, now he lives in Najaf, which is the big seminary for um, uh, scholars in Najaf, Iraq. And he came actually to Southminster during uh, our Advent season and talked about Mary from the Quran, which was really a, a fascinating uh, conversation. So, so I'm with the two. So most of the time, Josh and I are with this tour group, and, and every day there are, you know, s uh, sermons and different kinds of things, and we go and visit the shrines, and so we learned a lot about, I learned a lot about American Shias more than anything. In fact, so we did a lot of uh, interviews with them um, about what it, uh, what it all meant. So our tour group has the red bandanas. So you have these tour groups from all over, and you have to have a colored bandana because you'll get lost uh, and, and, and all of this mass of, of people. So we're walking through Karbala, and, uh, and the sign is 72, because the 72 is that symbolic number of the companions of Hussein who were, who were uh, killed, um, Ashura. Karbala. Okay, this is a city that has no traffic lights, or hardly any, okay? It has no sewage system. It has no electric grid, all right, basically. Or it has kind of, it's a minor little spotty electric grid and a lot of generators, and the water is bottled, all right? It's like when I first was there, it was like a post-apocalyptic kind of place. People were walking and around, and, um, and yet this city, this is the deal, it hosts 15 million plus visitors, all right? So you can imagine, 15 million people walking into Portland. All right, could Portland handle it? <laughs> Here's Karbala, this is a city without any infrastructure, without any an organization. It's not organized by anybody, this event, and it just happens. And so they talk about it, um, the city itself, like a mother just, you know, expands so all her children can come <laughs> to the house, that kind of thing, and it just uh, opens up space. So, so now during Arbaeen, this, this about two or three week period, um, Food is free. People will offer food all along the streets. People will sleep along the streets. Um, or, or if they have places to sleep, uh, the people will have a space for them. So, so here's somebody offering food uh, to a passerby because they're honoring those who are visiting uh, the Imam, Imam Hussein. The, and so this is right next to the hotel that we stayed at in Karbala. Um, and Iraqi chai, and you can see it's got lots of sugar. That's one big scoop of sugar for one little glass. I got hooked on that stuff. That's really strong and sugary, and it keeps you going. Okay, so the people of Iraq, all right, this is, uh, these, are, these are poor people, but they live for this day, and so they will raise a camel or a cow or, or whatever and be able to uh, offer that as food for people who are making this ziyarat or visitation. So I had my first camel when I was in Iraq. It's, it's a lot like beef. Um, or some cows back there. So um, there's sheep. All right. So. So all so you got all of this food. So people are, are making this. It's a big deal, and, and as you and, and as you go along, people are are yelling at you to take food. 
<laughs> right? Take, take this food because they want, they want you to uh, uh, be served with, with their hospitality. I'm going to come back to this gentleman here in a little bit. His name is uh, Al-Sistani. He is actually from Iran, but he is the uh, Shia leader uh, in Iraq. And one thing I learned when I was there is that it was he, uh, more than any, who helped drive out ISIS from Iraq. Uh, he uh, issued a religious decree, a fatwa, uh, to uh, all able-bodied people, if they could, to go and resist the terrorists who were destroying the shrines and destroying the people uh, uh, in, in Iraq. So it was really, and it wasn't just Shias, he called all people, Sunni Shias, Christians also went and resisted uh, ISIS, largely in the, the popular mobilization army uh, came out of that. And so his Sistani is very highly uh, revered for a little, uh, how, how it works. You see, he has a black turban, and then you'll see also shakes with white turbans. Well, the black versus the white means the black turban is that if they're actual descendants of um, Muhammad and the al Bayt, the house of the prophet. Uh, and the white turbans are those who, they're also scholars too, and they may be, but it's the connection there, uh, genetic, or heredity. So there is, uh, there we are. Okay, so popular images. Now, Islam generally doesn't have popular images, right? Um, and, and in fact, when you tell the stories, if you do have images, you put a, a light in the face. Nonetheless, the images are very popular, and so people like them. And so uh, Hussein is here, and this is Abbas, is the flag bearer, his half-brother. And so you'll find images like this uh, all over the place of people, you know, celebrating. And he actually kind of has a Jesus look about him, I think. So there are many comparisons, I think, between... Uh, Jesus and Hussein in, in many different ways, uh, theologically as well as historically. Um, so what we did is we went and we put our camera up one night, just tried to get some inter street interviews. And so this is the Al Qibla. This is the street that goes up to the main street that goes to uh, the shrine of Hussein. And uh, this gentleman that I'm interviewing here is named uh, Muhammad Ali, and he is from Canada. And so he did talk to me about different kinds of things. I asked him about, you know, what, what, why, uh, uh, why are they celebrating Hussein? Why are so many people coming and all of that kind of thing? So um, one of the other things before we get to the walk, our tour group also went to Baghdad and then to Samara because in Baghdad and Kazmain, the seventh and the ninth Imam are buried there. And then in Samara, I think it's the 10th and 11th Imams, and there are 12 altogether. By the way, the 12th is still alive, all right, or believed to be alive, and will return with, guess who? Jesus. Jesus and the 12th Imam will return to establish uh, the kingdom. So Jesus is highly revered. Uh, in Islam, obviously, as, as, as a prophet, and when the last judgment comes, uh, uh, the 12th Imam and Jesus will come back and, and establish the peace. So, but anyway, these, all of these Imams were killed as martyrs in some form or another. They were poisoned or whatever. So throughout uh, the tradition, these Imams are resistors of tyranny and resistors of corrupt governments, and so they're always getting in trouble. And so they end up... Um, uh, be, being killed. And so we went to Baghdad and, and again in Samara. This is in Kazmain. And this is in Samara. And you can see the construction around there. In 2007, ISIS terrorists destroyed this dome. They blew it up because the fundamentalists, the Wahhabis and the Takfiris and the Salafists and the ISIS, all, the, all of those people, their main enemy are the Shias because the Shias are, you know, are, are actually, I think, very smart. And they are also resist corrupt governments and they have a history about it and they feel that shrines are important, but the fundamentalists don't think the shrines are there and so they blow up the shrines. So they're always persecuting the Shias. So this dome was built back uh, and in 2009 it opened again. So that was the place where we actually saw some military stuff of people protecting uh, around the shrines. And right in, right, a huge poster of Hussein, you know, and to show that, uh, you know, they, they, they were able to beat them off. 
Um, while we were there, we got a lot of media attention because we went to the shrine to get the pass, and that ended up going out on the news. And so people made the story ended up being a lot about us. I am was really the whitest guy in the room, all right, for the whole time. I mean, there are I didn't find anybody else from America there except those on our tour group with us, and 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 they didn't claim to be from America. Oftentimes, though, they were, but they would talk about their ancestral heritage, where you're from, oh, Pakistan or something. So, um, but people would come up to us all the time and want selfies with us, and 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 we ended up being in the uh, in the media and and whatnot. Um, and so I just kind of went with it, and there you go. Although, uh, in fact, they, they did an article that said, President of U.S. Church. <laughs> you know, comes to, and, and uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, so, so it was really, we were kind of celebrities, so to speak, as, as we were there, just because somebody, somebody's from around, and we were very welcome, incredibly embraced, and glad, and wanted to get the message to the rest of America, please come and see us. Please come and learn our story. Uh, learn who we are. Um, that's a, uh, I'm going to skip that part. Okay. All right, so the walk begins. Okay. So this walk is between the city of Najaf and Karbala, 50 miles, 80 kilometers. And so people will go like I say, if they're, if they're flying, just that are flying, they'll fly into Najaf and do the walk. Some will walk from Iran itself, 400 kilometers. There are people who walked from Russia. There are people who walked from Egypt. So walking from all over the place. And uh, we started at actually at Pillar 110. We couldn't get all the way into the, the town. So we, we ended up going 50 miles, but it wasn't actually from Pillar Zero. And these pillars are 50 meters apart, and they mark where you are all along, all along the walk. So we started at night. And so while we were there, we had Josh pull out the camera, and we interviewed some people. These are some young people, from, young men from Pakistan, and asked them you know, why they were here and, and what they were doing and, and what the walk meant to them. And then we stayed the first night at the Iranian Media Center. So um, about... A lot of the people who are making this pilgrimage are, are, are from Iran. The Islamic Republic of Iran is actually run by Shia scholars, okay? And I learned a lot of things about Iran, um, the, and, and especially in terms of the U.S. has this thing going with them. But really, um, well, I would challenge that. And, uh, and, and, they, they, uh, and so I met a lot of people from Iran, and they have a media center. And so we were invited to go and... and, and there, and you can see, this is a building, right? Okay, think of this, think of uh, state fairgrounds, right? It's got buildings and stuff, and most of the year it's empty, right? But the, when the fair is on, then it's all filled with people. Okay, so this road, 50 miles from Najaf to Karbala is like a big fairground. And most of the year, it's empty. But it also has buildings, and tents and all along the way and there's nobody who's organizing this there's just no it's not run by any government or anything it's just set up as people do this for all of these pilgrims that have started to come and so this is a major building and so across the pathway is this bridge and so we got some pictures and whatnot from there so just to get you the scale of this here here this is wall-to-wall -wall people for 50 miles. And that's only the first path. There's the, the freeway path is out here. So that's also going along. And so, we, so if you want to go on the fast lane, because <laughs> this, on this line, on this lane, or all along the side are places to eat, are tents that people have set up for you to sleep. Uh, they'll give you a massage. I actually didn't get a massage. Uh, but um, they, they would do that if you wanted it, uh, all of these kinds of things. Then you can go over to the fast lane and go a little bit faster. But all, all along the way are, are, is all of this hospitality for, and it, from all over the place, uh, all over the world, wherever there are, are Shias who come and, and participate in this. And it isn't just Shias. Sunnis are welcome. I was welcome as a Christian. The one thing I'd heard again and again and again is Hussein is for everyone. Hussein is for everyone. It doesn't really matter what your, your, your religion is. So that's what it looks like when you're in it, okay? Lots of people. Um, the whole event, I thought, was, was prayer. 
basically it was a constant prayer. Um, and then, oh, this is an actual, you know, they're doing prayer at noon here, but um, all along you hear sounds, uh, 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 chants, poetry of the, of the story of, of Asherah. Uh, it is mourning, they are, it's crying, it's weeping, uh, it's uh, doing matam, uh, being in the chest or touching the head. It is a, it's a constant crying. And I kept asking, what, is the, what are you crying for? And then they always said, well, we're crying for Hussein and, and on all of that, as if he died yesterday, okay? And, and thinking, well, it's also, it's also a sense of mourning for the present suffering of the world, too. And, and they'll, yeah, 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 but it's really about Hussein, they'll say. But so, um, but, but, but there is, it's just, just, it's a power, but it was really a very emotional experience for me to go, to go through this. There's Astani again. Um, okay, so all along, every 50 meters is a pillar, and there are about 1,400 of them. On every one, and this has just started in the last few years, are images of martyrs. These are young men who were killed fighting ISIS. And they're very happy because just about a year after I got back, just about a year, I celebrated the year of actually driving ISIS out. So uh, they are very proud of the fact that they, as, as a country of Iraq, which is divided and, and, and everything, were able to find uh, their common uh, a goal in that. And the story of Hussein has, is a spiritual uh, energy, I think, that helped them be able to, to resist that type of, of tyranny. Uh, these are all one of the, when I mentioned Sheikh, uh, my friend, uh, who I met there, one of his teachers was, um, was this guy here, uh, one of the scholars, and these all were killed. They're all, they're, these were religious scholars, and they went off to fight ISIS, and they were all uh, killed by ISIS. So pictures along the way, all, all along the way of the walk, flags, people bringing flags from uh, whatever country they're from. Uh, 60 different nations uh, were, re were represented, um, at least. So we ended the first day at um, Pillar 820, and this was the, um, this was a, a mokib. Uh, whoop. <laughs> I don't know where I got on that one. Did I hit a wrong button? But it's racing through. Okay. I got it. It's right here. So again, whenever we'd stop, we'd be, you know, people would talk to us, want to know where we are and where we were from and, and, and whatnot. Um, <laughs> some probably just needed a break. It was very dusty. Um, and it was cold, so it's at the changing of the season. So it's like in the 90s during the day, but then at night it would get cold. And so this is October, end of October. So it'll get now as we move into the seas, it goes by lunar calendar, so it'll get hotter and hotter as the time goes on. So it can be in Iraq, in the desert, up to 140, 140 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. So it's, a, you don't go out then, you just got, go underneath. But we were actually, at a, at a, as it turned out, the time we went was rather mild. Um, so we stayed at the, uh, oh, I don't have a picture of that, but we stayed at this mokib that was an Indian mokib and it slept 4,500 people, all run by volunteers. And so it was just amazing. Uh, this a huge building that they built. And then remember, it's just for this event. This, this, there's no city in, a, in all of this space here within these 50 miles. So they're, they're making this for this thing. And this happened, I should say something really quickly. When did this all start? And it started after the fall of Saddam Hussein. So Saddam Hussein was a Baathist, and he uh, did not like the Shias. Remember, Saddam Hussein is put in by the United States way back then, and, and so and, and, and the Iran-Iraq war uh, is was interesting for the Shias' perspective because the Shias from Iraq basically just defected because they aren't going to fight <laughs> there. So, the, but the enemy is, is Saddam, and he would prevent people from walking to the um, shrine 
because he saw this as um, a challenge to his authority. And so uh, my neighbor, my good friend, Musan al-Dalami, who is the imam at the Islamic Center of Portland right across the street from us, is from Najaf, Iraq. And in 1977, they had a, um, a rebellion against Saddam and they walked and they were captured and tortured and many were killed and he was, he was tortured as well. But it was an important fact that he ended up leaving after that and coming to the United States. So Saddam was, was not a good guy. And so when he finally, when the Americans, kind of an ir irony here, dropped him, then people started going to the shrine. So this walk of millions of people now of, has happened really just since 2003. Of, and it didn't happen by any organization or no religious decree. It just, people started walking. Beg said, uh, Bahamad Beg, he said, it's kind of like, he said, it's a crass way to put it, but it's kind of like Forrest Gump. He just started going. And so all these people just started, started going from all over the world, um, being able to go to this shrine. Um, so you'd see that I, I accuse that not very many things are in English, but every now and then you'll find something in English. And Hussein is a figure, a symbol of international, beyond religion, beyond um, politics, a figure of, of justice, a uh, figure of standing up against oppressors and of, and of law. So there we are. As, as I mentioned, it was kind of dusty. Uh, so emergencies. So people are rising about toilets and all that kind of stuff. Well, there, there are mostly, you know, as you, as you know, if you're not, well, they have Western toilets in some cases. Some Mokibs actually had those, but most of them are, you know, basically holes in the, in the, in the ground. But they're all along, so there's always plenty uh, of toilets around. There's medical care, little, whether like these trailers set up. We followed a person who had a backpack and said, I'm a doctor if people need things. So all along the way, all your, all your, your needs are, are met. Um, what's the button in my present, Steve? Let's see. Can you get me on again? So, all men, I know. Okay, no, it's not all men. Uh, um, uh, the, the women too, probably mostly are men, but women, women and children. That was you'd you'd go along, and I, I'm you know dressed up. I got you know I bought hiking pants and I got my hiking boots. There are people walking this thing in bare feet, okay, <laughs> or, or sandals or, or or whatever. And um, and yeah, it's close. That's good. Yeah, I'll go back a couple of them here. Okay. The, uh, one of the stories that's a powerful story is that uh, Hussein has a six-month-old baby, Ali Asghar. And during the battle, he takes his baby. He's out to the end, and there's no water. They're, they're surrounded, and they can't have water. And he's calling out to the enemy, and he's saying, you, you attack us. What about these children? What about these children? What about our six-month-old baby and these children? And as he's saying this, an arrow comes and kills the baby. So that, that's, the, that's the kind of the, the level of, of cruelty, of recounting the, the cruelty of these stories. And so you'll find a lot of images of, of a six-month-old baby or, or, or whatever uh, like that. So there are some kids along the way. So kids are, this is a guy I talked with for about 90 minutes. It was amazing, he was from India and, and it was an amazing, for me, it really was a, we were making a video, but it really wasn't about that. To me, it was a really kind of a spiritual quest of my own. Um, this little girl here, you can't quite see it, but she is offering perfume. So and then she's giving perfume to the visitors, so they'll smell nice when they go and visit the imam. <laughs> and uh, so uh, well, let me play this, and you can get an idea of what it looks like. Is there sound for this? If you see women, they all have the chadar. Whoops, excuse me. Chadar is um, like a, a, a hood that goes around the head and you hold it in front. So that's the traditional Iraqi uh, chadar. And so in, in this uh, area of, of 
of southern Iraq and on these holy cities of Karbala and Najaf, it is the requirement that women are covered. Uh, in Baghdad, it is a secular, Iraq is a secular country, so women are not covered there. But um, uh, in, in here, when you go to the place, and you go, when you go to your se separate places in, into the shrine itself. So here's a woman with a cane walking along. I mean, you have people in wheelchairs, um, different flags. And, and if the, the sound comes on, you'll get the sound. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but all along, you'll, you'll be poetry, whether it's in Urdu or uh, Farsi or in Arabic, um, all telling, all recounting this, this story. So it's like a big family reunion in some respects for, for Shias, because they're usually the minority throughout um, uh, within the Muslim community as well as within the other, other communities too. So that's the, they did the prediction of how many people came to Karbala this last year, 15 million they felt onto the city. So if they just, just to get the figure around that, that's the largest uh, yearly human gathering on the planet. The Hajj in Arabia is three million, and and that's all Saudi Arabia money, right? Making that thing happen, and there's still tramplings and all kinds of things. There wasn't anything like that here. There's no um, uh, tramplings or, or violence or, or anything that we heard of like that. Um, so we we ended finally. We did 50 miles, and I tell you, that was not. I'm I'm, I'm not really that great at all. You can see me. I'm not any great hiker. But so it was, it was strenuous, but it was also really incredibly uh, uh, energizing as well. So here's the shrine itself. So this is our picture. Um, I don't know if we're going to get sound on that, but it would be a, a sound of. Um, is there a mute button on that thing? Oh. I don't know. I think I just turned it off again. Well, there we go. Okay. Um, so that is the shrine itself of Imam uh, Hussein, and it's all in red during the season, red for the, for the, the blood that was shed uh, by um, Hussein and his companions. Now if you go there, it's in blue. There are some sayings in English which are very interesting to find out what it was the honorable stand in which al Abbas, that's the brother, uh, had taken uh, in the bloody battle, makes us bow down solemnly in honor of him. All right, so it's, it's, it's mourning. Uh, the, that's the water bottle of Abbas. He went one time to get water for the children, and, 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 he, and he went, and while he's getting water for the children, and they uh, chop his arm off, and so he carries the bottle with the other arm, and they chop that arm off, and he carries the bottle with his teeth, and, and they bring it back and finally he's killed. So it's really, there's a, these elaborations of the story. It almost seems like gory, you know, and continuing to tell the story again and again, but it's that aspect to it that gives the uh, emotion to um, the following of it. Uh, what I like best were the rainbow feather dusters. <laughs> That's what they use to direct traffic, right? We should give the Portland cops rainbow feather dusters. <laughs> That's how they led people through the, you know, the, where, the, all through the shrine. If you, you know, yalla, yalla, yalla means get going, moving along. But they'd tap you with the feather duster. <laughs> um, prayer, again, prayer. So people are always praying, reading or praying through this whole time. It's really an incredible religious experience, uh, young and old. Uh, you'll never be able to erase my glory, eradicate well, my dignity uh, is, the, is, is, the, is, is the theme, a constant theme of, of justice and standing up to tyranny, standing up to oppression. Um, that comes again. This, uh, this is in the shrine of Imam Hussein, and this gentleman that I'm with there is from Iran. So I said, the U.S. and Iran, brothers at the shrine of Imam Hussein. And there's another, another picture from the top. And I don't know if we're going to get the sound here, but this is actually going into the shrine itself. And so all, all through this, as you can just hear the, uh, I wish the sound was happening. I'm not sure what I'm doing, but um, through the, it gives the, uh, the uh, the, the, the feeling of the constant um, music that, that's going through the place. 
So again, we didn't get to go into the women's place, but that would be similar as, as you're going in. So these are, at least let's get the image here. So some people have some cell phones, but as you get closer. So, so what they're doing there is, is, is matam. And what that means, okay, well, I was told. When Hussein is killed and his people are killed, the enemy starts beating victory drums. Boom, 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 boom. And that is more discouraging even than death itself for the, for the survivors. And so what now is they do when they beat the chest, it's like they're beating the victory drum. So it looks as though Hussein won the battle, but really the story is, is that justice won for those, or, or not Hussein, Yazid won the battle, but the real story is that the victory is, uh, are, are those who keep uh, the memory alive and keep the activity for justice alive. So for example, we, one might ask, why does Iran care about the Palestinians? None of the Palestinians are Shia. I mean, they're, 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 they're Sunni, and yet Iran will take on Israel in order to, uh, for justice for uh, the Palestinians because uh, of this message, no matter where there is injustice, Yemen, another example. And again, it is, they aren't uh, Shias, uh, but, but Iran will, and, and those who are Shia will stand for those, um, ask for those people who are oppressed. And so, that, that idea, we, I learned a phrase that every day is Ashura, that's the day that they were killed, and every land is Karbala. So meaning uh, that wherever we are throughout our lives, wherever there is oppression, um, the, uh, the Imam Hussein and, and those who follow Hussein, the Shias, those who will say, Labek Ya Hussein, here I am Hussein, um, are, are standing for the cause of, of justice. Um, the last person to be killed in the battle was Hussein himself, and he so he stood up and uh, and he's and, and and he's speaking throughout history according to the story, uh, and he says, uh, "Who will help me?" And so the response is, "Labek Ya Hussein, here I am." It's kind of, we have this in our hymn. We say, "Here I am, Lord." Well, it's the same thing. Here I am, uh, Hussein. I will stand with you. And the standing is you interpret it yourself, but largely it will have to do with standing up for those who are oppressed. Uh, standing up for those who are tyrannized, uh, no matter what, what, what the odds are against you. And I found that to be, and I'll just say my personal story here, just a quick thing, really moving. Um, I, it was, to me, and I went over there and I said, you know, Hussein and Jesus are brothers. They, uh, and, and so there's, there's no reason that we should ever be thinking that we are not. Uh, and, and it was really a, a powerful to me, understanding of what I felt Jesus was about too. Uh, I found the depth, as I said, kind of found the depth of my own faith by having an interaction with, with another. So, there you go. That's, uh, I'll stop right there, because I know it's, al it's already late. So, is there, are there questions, though, or comments? I don't know if it's that different. There was a Sunni that we interviewed, and I came down, and, 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 and he says that the Sunnis and the, and the Shias are, are together in terms of Hussein. And so um, there are the groups that we have that are bombing and stuff. Those are neither. <laughs> those are just real fundamentalist groups that are, uh, have different views altogether. Uh, the, the Sunnis are, don't necessarily regard the teachings of the al Bayt, the family of the prophet, as authoritative as the Shias do. And so they'll have different traditions of, of authority, kind of, I, I guess you could say Catholics and Protestants, <laughs> in, in some level like that. But, um, what were the Wahhabis? The Wahhabis? The Wahhabists? Yeah, they are, um, they are some of the ones that have bombed the, as well, did a lot of the bombings. Uh, in Baghdad, in fact, the teacher who um, uh, was killed was actually going to have a fighting them. They are um, bad news. <laughs> and there are a lot of, uh, Saudi Arabia just produces those people. Um, so the, the, the Takfiris, the Salafists, the Wahhabists, they are people who think that they are the only ones who should be alive. Unless you believe like us, uh, you're out. And, and so that type of thing, 
has, 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 has grown. And, and, and it's important what I found coming here to Mary is that we, we identify, we get to figure out who, who's who. It's important for us to know who's on the right side. Uh, and, and for me, it was the, the, these Shias were, who are really the ones who are carrying the load of justice. And they're often vilified in media in the West. You know, another thing I went, um, had I worked for CNN, I would have been treated like royalty. I already was. They were looking, where are the reporters from America to come and talk about this kind of thing? I mean, they did have a couple of reports from the BBC, but really America media has, has completely ignored this. And, and there are 15 million stories out there I could have told. And so, uh, and, and so we, we really don't know a lot. And that's, that was the message I kept getting from people is that America, do some research <laughs> and don't just necessarily trust what the, what the political media is telling us because they're beating the war drums against Iran right now. Um, uh, and and fact, for no good reason in, in my view. Um, so again, I don't want to get too political on this, but it's hard not to <laughs> when you go over and, and really see what, 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 what it's happening in a lot of ways um, to see what some, uh, in, in regards to uh, the issues of justice. So Saudi Arabia, yeah, when we were there is when that was after the, just right after that guy, uh, Yashogi, right? But a lot of the story is Yemen uh, that we don't know about. Um, and here's a country that has been bombed um, and attacked. And from the Yemeni perspective, the people who are doing it are the United States because it's American planes and bombs that they're finding made in Texas. So, and, and, and so there, there's, there's a sense in which people were coming back, recognize what your own government's doing uh, in regards to uh, helping the Saudis out. So, so definitely, yeah, it's, it's politics and religion are not separate. It's all a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, that's very, very clear. There, there are, there's another mosque that we, we actually do things with called the Bilal Mosque in Beaverton, and, and, they're, and they're a great group too. And actually these groups get along well. There are some that aren't so, that are Saudi run. Uh, they're, they're less helpful. Uh, uh, and Saudis, you know, we often talk about the Israel lobby having influence in the United States. Well, there's also a Saudi lobby that has a huge influence and a lot of money is, is poured in. Uh, and, and, and often the texts, are, are very fundamentalist texts and, and translations of the Quran and those kinds of things. So I, what I found with the Shias, I didn't realize there's a, there's a huge intellectual tradition here that is really incredible and are really important dialogue partners. So I would, I'm hoping, if there's a hope that I have, is that there's a way of, of really being able to uh, talk with scholars from uh, Islam and, and have Christian scholars connect with them. I, I, think, I think it'd be great to have historical Jesus and historical Hussein study or something, you know, to, have, to be able to talk about, because we have a lot in common. But I see, even the way we understand our, our, our people, it helped me understand sacrifice better for Jesus, because uh, that was what they talk about, the sacrifice of Hussein, of giving oneself for, uh, for, for goodness and for justice and whatnot. We think of it as, as Jesus uh, did the same. Yeah. Any other questions? Or? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting when, when, when Christians are thinking, gosh, how can we keep young people in our church? There's no problem here. Uh, I mean, there are all, all age groups are, are, are out there, you know, giving themselves for, for this uh, and, and participating in that. I, I don't know, I guess, what, Burning Man? <laughs> but um, in fact, we were told this, this is the one way, one road, you know, the one, one, the one direction to Karbala. And, 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 and one of the things that was really most meaningful to me was how welcome I was as a Christian. I told them, yeah, I'm a Christian pastor from America. And people, you know, after they absorb that, and then, we're, and then say, yeah, and, and Hussein is for you. 
Hussein, and so you're welcome here. It was uh, th that complete uh, embrace and, and welcome uh, along the way um, was really powerful. So, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know of any other comparison like that, but um, I do know that there's something to live for uh, with, this, with this group, and that is really an uh, activity for as I keep saying again and again, for, for, for justice. And so uh, she is, I think the, one of the great things is to meet, um, uh, she is in our own area, or, or other most, all Muslims too, not just she is, but all, all Muslims and have this, this uh, uh, a conversation of really what, uh, we have a lot more in common than we think uh, in terms of our, our religion. And one of the scary things is that we don't, we, we don't the media has been so distorting of, of all of this that it's hard to, get a handle on it, but there's so much in common, and, and uh, I, I would think that we should be able to put readings from the Quran in our worship services, you know, include that, um, because they're really, you can see it as the, my wife said, well, you're kind of, uh, considering these people as kind of like saints, you know, in the Christian tradition, and, and that's true. I mean, I think there are ways that we can connect theologically uh, that would help us in terms of understanding and building relationships. Yes. Were they English speaking, or, or did you have to have a translator? Or how, how did you communicate? Well, yeah, I didn't have a translator, and I don't know anything else uh, besides English. Uh, so it was, it, uh, if, if people spoke English, that was the way that they could talk to me. And there, and there were enough along the way that, that that could happen. But obviously, most of it was not sure, yeah. And, uh, and, the, and the big languages would be the Farsi and, and Arabic, and then on the, from Pakistan, Urdu. So I met a lot of people from Iran, uh, and, they were, and they were the most curious in many respects about me, uh, being from America and, and talking about us and what we were doing, and, 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 and happily to engage in, in political views and, and political conversations and whatnot. So, and, uh, yeah. But yeah, a lot of the, yeah. Um, or do they think that we are really for <laughs> Well, I certainly dispensed all of that. <laughs> but you're probably, you know, in the 99th percentile of the community in North America, right? I would assume so. Yeah. Well, no, I, again, I, I heard you know, often. They, they certainly do know, know more about, and, 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 and it's not that everybody's all the same by any means and what their, what their views are or whatnot, but, but that message I kept getting a lot was, yeah, please, please learn about, about our story because um, we, we know that the, the, the news isn't coming accurate. Yeah, so there was a sense in which they, they, they want us to know more and, and to be able to, to learn more about it. And, uh, and that's, and that's going to be a challenge uh, because we've been pretty well hit. Um, you know, these guys that I mentioned from, from Pakistan, they said, you know, we weren't involved in 9-11. <laughs> that was, uh, you know, uh, and uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't us. And, and people misunderstand what we do when we do uh, the, the matam or, you know, and sometimes, you know, uh, 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 this is, uh, this is our, 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 our way of mourning. And that was another thing that was just so powerful was the mourning. That I don't think we mourn very well. Um, and, and it was really a teaching of how, of how to lament and how to mourn uh, the injustices of the world. And, 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 and like I say, the whole walk was like prayer for me. So anyway, so I'm, I'm was really glad to go. I hope other people can go uh, or, or see it. And like I say, we were making this video. Um, and it'll come out in, in April, and we'll put it up on YouTube or something, and I'll have a link to it so you can see a little bit more in, in images and whatnot. But um, uh, is, it, is that time? Do we still have time? I don't know what that means. Does that mean it's over, or are we still going? Oh, well, I'm happy here to keep, keep talking with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And wondering how how we parse out thinking that you know what's going on in, in, in Syria. I mean that's a, a Shia group that's been charged there. Uh, it's it's hard sometimes to see who's 
Um, yep. <laughs> I'm debating with myself how far to go. Um, the United States and Israel and Saudi Arabia, I believe, are the real terrorists in the Middle East. They are ones that are causing a great deal of uh, destruction and have uh, for some time uh, and it's and it, it isn't that it's not d been designed um, uh, to destabilize these countries for the purpose of of of, of making of, of, of making trouble uh, uh, and and some of the and the Shias are some of the, and so the stories that we have out of Syria I think are a lot are, are not as very accurate from Western media um, I think sometimes Iranian media is a good thing to read um, press TV. Uh, as well, he, I mean, everything has got its own slant, but um, reading, reading media that we aren't hearing. Uh, Russian media is also a helpful thing. Uh, and you have to remember, when the communists were gone, the United States needed an enemy. And, and uh, one, I believe, was created uh, with Islamic, so-called Islamic terrorism. And, uh, I'll just go out and say it so you know, I think that 9-11 is, is a false flag. That 9-11 wasn't caused by Muslims at all. That that was caused by something else to create this idea of a constant war on terror. And um, now I'm not saying everybody thinks that, but pretty much about 80% of, of the world's Muslims do. They know that they weren't at fault for this. And so there's a lot of things that have been happening uh, in the Middle East that are, uh, are, are led by my country. And I didn't tell this story and I should tell this. I went into the shrine um, and uh, swam through the bodies, as you might think of it. Because they're, they're all, and the idea is to touch the, uh, the shrine, the grate over where his, his um, grave is. And as I walked in there and it went through the body and I got right up to it, and I couldn't quite reach it. I'm about this far away from touching it. And, um, and remember, I'm the whitest guy in the room. This brown hand takes my hand and pushes it up against it. And I catch the eye of the person who's done that. And, and, and it's like a flood of emotion just hit me of what all this meant as an American going over there. And we've destroyed this country. I mean, whatever you think of whatever we went into it, it's destroyed. Uh, and and uh, millions of people have died, uh, not only in, in Iraq, but in Afghanistan, and Yemen, and Syria, and, um, and, and, and whatever the United States thinks it's doing good, it, it, it is also doing bad. And, and, um, and its involvement there has not been helpful. And, and, and yet, here I am embraced and hugged by these people whom my own country has done such devastation toward. And so it was, and, and we don't know anything about it. There's no curiosity about what's happening in Iraq now, uh, uh, about and, and how we can uh, participate and help and build. And so that was, to me, I felt summoned by Hussein, um, the brother of Jesus to me, to be able to tell the truth as best as I know it and, and, um, and know that that's not going to always be a very popular truth. But I, but I, I, I would hope that um, we as Americans and American Christians and myself can really work to, to learn the truth and speak truth uh, and, and, and speak for reconciliation between well, what's going on. If you look at a map, uh, military bases, they surround Iran. American unit, uh, I mean, who's, attack, who's threatening who? And so th those are the kinds of questions that I think need to, need to uh, be talked about.
says, Tennessee email, anytime you have a question about what you see on the news, it will clarify for you about what's happening over here. So they yes. would love to hear from you and help, help you educate your congregation appropriately about the corner of the world and even about the Presbyterian witness in the corner of the world, which is very ecumenical. I'm really glad you mentioned Scott and Elmer. Yes, they came to my church, too, and, and, and talked about that and from their work in, in Iraq. So that's very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. I, I uh, hopefully I will talk with you uh, individually too.